Good evening, everyone. My name is Annie Benzi. I am the chair of the Fellow of Subcommittee for SSAT. Um, we have a great talk um, this evening, and I am so honored that Dr. Zeng, current president of SSAT, uh, is our moderator. Um, she's also chair of the Department of Surgery, as well as the James Utley Professor at Boston University School of Medicine and Surgeon in Chief at Boston Medical Center, um, as well as a surgical oncologist for this very interesting topic that we have that is a bit of a uh, intra intraoperative uh, conundrum and a diagnostic dilemma at times. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Singh, take it away and introduce our speaker. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. After after Dr. Slavin starts to talk, I'm actually going to move to a room which has better lighting, so I'm not in some mysterious um, dark room. But I'm I'm very excited for this. I have followed these and and, and been a, a a lurker at some of these in the in the in the past. So I just wanted to just co compliment the SSAT committees and the residents and fellows and the, 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 the to be able to do this because it's just a great exchange, something I wish I had had when I was in training to be able to communicate with other people about hard and interesting cases. Because some, sometimes we feel like we're all alone because many times people put their, their best foot forward in presenting things, even on you know that wonderful place, Twitter, but people put their best case, their best case scenario. And then you wonder, am I all alone? How come I had this complication or how come this was so hard? Why is this so hard for me? It must be easy for other people. So I just really wanted to compliment the SAT and the subcommittees that put these together to actually exchange knowledge in a in a in a positive fashion. So and I will I will apologize. Um I, I'm gonna ask Dr. Slavin. Is it Dr. Moran Slavin? Or how do I pronounce your name? I have asked everybody now, when I make interviews, I ask everybody how to say their name. So I'm not mispronouncing people's names, but uh, Dr. Slavin, I think you're, or is it Slavin or Slavin? You're still, you're still muted, I think. Hi, hello. So it's uh, Moran Slavin. It's an Israeli name. That's why it's a bit more hard to pronounce. It's, it's not hard to pronounce. Uh, it, it's not at all, but I just happen to know people with the same spelled last names that say Slavin, they say Slavin. Um, mm -hmm. so, so Moran, the emphasis on the second syllable. Uh, it is. Okay, Moran Slavin. Am I saying that correctly? Yep. Okay, so she's a fellow with Dr. Sharona Ross um, at, at, at Advent Health Tampa, Florida. When And uh, those of you who don't know, I think everybody knows, but Dr. Ross is one of the busiest, most proficient pancreatic and pancreatic biliary and, you know, um, in the general region of the of the right and left upper abdomen surgeons, I have met I met Dr. Ross many years ago. I think just being being a being a trainee, she was already a senior figure. Again, we're talking about ageless people. She is absolutely ageless. ageless. But I I really admire that she has really she spearheaded this women in surgery conference, which I've never been able to go to, but I think I'm lucky enough to be able to go this year. And and watching her, how she promotes her trainees like Dr. Slavin is, is very exciting. So without further ado, Dr. Slavin, take it away. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, the topic of this uh, talk is going to be duodenal adenocarcinoma. Uh, what uh, brought this uh, subject forward was the, um, we had a series of uh, some very technically challenging uh, whipples for uh, this pathology. And uh, it kind of uh, made us uh, question why, why was this harder than even uh, the harder cases of uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And uh, diving into the subject, um, I think that um, there is a misconception that this is a disease because the biology is better than also that the treatment is easier. Uh, however, as you see uh, in, a, in a few minutes, um, both the walk up, the surgical treatment, and even the medical oncologic treatment is kind of uh, uh, complex. Okay, so oh, just a second. Okay, so in today's talk, uh, I'm gonna give an overview on the tumor biology. Um, talk about preoperative walk-up, uh, about the challenges that we face intraoperatively. Uh, ho I hope we get to do the literature review and discuss outcome. Um, this is a rare disease. The um, um, data is relatively scarce compared to pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, we can dive to each one of those topics for an entire lecture, and I'm going to really try to um, give like an overview of 
uh, the most. So our case, um, just an example of the last one that we had is uh, a patient, 59 year old male, initials WN, uh, with a primary um, past medical history of obesity, hypertension, and GERD. And this patient had multiple ER visits for nausea, vomiting, and inability to tolerate oral intake for about a month. Uh, eventually, someone took him and did an EGD and EUS, um, which you will see was a bit limited. They saw esophagitis and gastritis. They saw a normal major papilla. They saw a uh, finding in the duodenum, which they defined as acquired duodenal stenosis. This was dilated. And then they performed an EOS, uh, which recognized one large uh, lymph node in the patoduodenal ligament. However, the lesion of the duodenum itself was not evaluated by the EOS. The patient had a negative um, biopsy from the duodenal and from, from the duodenal lesion and the lymph node. And then he uh, went uh, ahead and had an MRI that showed an apple core lesion in the third duodenum. And this is all from an outside facility. And at this point, he was still uh, managed as an outpatient. So two weeks later, the patient is not doing very well. He's still uh, vomiting, not tolerating a diet. He has a repeat EGD, uh, which shows worsening esophagitis, bilus gastric fluid. And again, this finding in the duodenum, which was again dilated and biopsied and was found to be negative for malignancy. Uh, he had uh, an elevated CA99, as you can see. And at this point, he also has acute kidney injury and aspiration pneumonitis from um, repeated vomiting, and he was transferred to our facility. So this is a triple phase CT that was done uh, on his uh, transfer. And you will see uh, in a second um, that he has um, abnormal thickening of the second to third portion of the duodenum. There it is right there. I will show you a coronal section too. It may uh, show it even slightly better than this. Okay, so um, the patient completed uh, staging with the CT chest, abdomen, pelvis that was negative for any distant uh, disease. And at this point, he is clinically obstructed. He has an NG tube. He is NPO on TPN. And I would like to open the discussion. Uh, what do you think should be the next steps? I guess since I want you all to be very active members of the SSAT, I shouldn't pimp anybody. So <laughs> I don't think there are any wrong answers here. Somebody throw something out. Dr. Bertano, what do you think? Or Dr. Mai, one of the fellows. Or can you repeat what was done already in the previous slide? So we have uh, two uh, EGDs that saw this lesion in the duodenum, which was biopsied, and uh, the biopsies came back negative for malignancy. They were dilated twice. Mm -hmm. uh, but the patient kept coming back with obstruction. We have a triple face CT of the abdomen and a chest CT. Uh, non-contrast that were negative for distance uh, disease, but did show this lesion in the second to third duodenum, and also an MRI that uh, showed the same picture. Um, this is what was done. I think I would try to attempt a uh, repeating endoscopy and um, getting a better specimen from the biopsy. What the initial biopsy show? Initial biopsy showed uh, inflammatory changes. No um, even suspicious uh, malignancy, some atypia, nothing specific. He has an obstruction, just don't know why. Exactly. Was it done with a uh, ultrasound, the EGD itself? So the EGD was done uh, with an ultrasound, but they did not assess the lesion itself. 
with mm. the EOS. They only assessed for lymphadenopathy in the patoduodenal ligament. They did not describe the depth of invasion, the origin of the lesion. So I, I would suggest repeating the endoscopic ultrasound with a, a deep needle biopsies. Absolutely. Would anyone do any imaging, like PET scan? Be of any benefit, you think, in this case, in the absence of a tissue diagnosis of cancer? I think the patient needs an operation. The question is only which operations the patient need. To get a duodenal obstruction, they need an operation. Uh, op options, there are options to that, but if you want to definitively deal with this, the patient needs an operation to me. The question is only which one. Dr. Can, you Walmart, you me, Moran, can you remind me, what's the performance status of this patient? Healthy, not healthy? Was, I thought it was healthy, but. This is a 59 year old patient. He's, a, he's kind of a big guy, um, but he's uh, very healthy. Um, the only thing that I would say uh, impairs his ability to undergo like major surgery is the fact that he lost a lot of weight in, during that month that he was um, at least part of the time partially obstructed and then completely obstructed. Uh, but he was uh, started on TPN once he was transferred here, and his albumin uh, was uh, around three and a half at that point. I'd like to say something. Uh, Chuck Vollmer here. Two things to think about with this. Uh, I heard someone say this person needs an operation. I'm fully in that camp at the outset. There's been a lot of prelude to this, the patient suffering. He has a plumbing problem. And uh, too many times we went, or a lot of times when we're thinking about how to do things in the HPV track, we're always geared on the cancer element of it, the proof of such. Um, there's also a lot of value to what we do to help obstructions from all sorts of processes, which are almost always cancers, by the way. Uh, there's a lot of uh, concern and emphasis on uh, people working up this, particularly in the GI field, of having to chase the proof of that tumor over and over. And there are large delays that happen with these kind of cases. So I see this as you've got a clinically obstructed one way out of the stomach situation. It's a plumbing problem. It needs a surgical intervention at this point, which is largely gonna be a two for one and it's gonna help a cancer problem probably. Okay, the second thing I bring up when, as you look at this kind of case is you should be thinking, about gastronoma uh, as a possibility as well. So peptic ulcer disease, although this is strangely placed in the third portion of the duodenum, uh, atypical uh, peptic ulcer disease processes should be at gastronoma. That's where your EUS could be of help, uh, not only on the duodenal wall itself, but in the pancreas head zone as well. I have some comments, but I will. I want to see what um, the trainees have to say. I have a case that's actually quite similar to this, but but I would love to hear how this progresses. So, uh, Moran, remind me later to discuss my lady, Mrs. F. You can call her. Okay. Um, would anyone uh, think about any additional walk-up other than the usual uh, that we would do? for a lesion in this area that may require, or most probably will require a Whipple's procedure, uh, something more specific for this type of disease? Okay, so I'll tell you. <laughs> um, okay, so... Um, First of all, of course, basically, when we talk about periampillary malignancies, we uh, talk about four major types, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the most common, distal cholangiocarcinoma, ampullary adenocarcinoma, and duodenal adenocarcinoma, which is the rarest of these. Um, when we look at the NCCN guidelines, then we see that um, anatomically, it's a periampillary lesion, but biologically, uh, it's a small bowel lesion. It's a small bowel malignancy. Um, this uh, type of uh, 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 malignancy, um, because it's so rare, rare, 
was um, usually um, treated with like extrapolating um, data from colorectal uh, cancer. Uh, in the recent guidelines, there are actually uh, some specific uh, um, some specific um, uh, walk-up and treatment that was added. And this is one I wanna um, to emphasize. So first of all, as you mentioned here, the absolute uh, importance of the EUS as part of the um, endoscopic evaluation. Um, because the EOS, not only for the case of gastrinoma that was uh, mentioned, but also helps us sometimes to differentiate between a pancreatic tumor that's invading into the duodenum or the opposite, uh, except for, of course, the additional um, uh, information that we always look for about uh, lymphadenopathy and uh, vascular involvement. In addition, specifically when we're talking about uh, duodenal adenocarcinoma, it's very important to, uh, to refer to uh, genetic testing. Um, the most common Lynch syndrome, uh, familial adenopolyposis and Potsieger syndrome. Um, this is uh, because that if the patient uh, is a carrier, um, other than the fact that he would, uh, the family would have to be consulted, um, the, this could actually um, affect the way that we reconstruct in a Whipple because, uh, for example, for a patient that has Lynch syndrome, we would not want to do a uh, pyloric preserving uh, procedure. So this is specifically for duodenal adenocarcinoma. And, uh, of course, we also always have to think about the uh, risk factor for specifically this type of disease, which is Crohn's disease and celiac disease. So now um, some uh, videos uh, that we all like. So what I uh, try to do here uh, is to show uh, a, no like a normal Whipple for pancreatic adenocarcinoma and to compare certain parts of the operation to what we see in a duodenal case. So this is for this specific uh, part is for a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And you can see that with the coherization, um, the the tissue is is very easy to handle. The um, the weight of the duodenum that we're trying to mobilize is not very uh, high. Not it doesn't weigh a lot. It's not um, a bulky tumor. It's almost bloodless. Uh, the planes are very very clear. Um, uh, look at the instruments that we're using uh, to dissect. And uh, the fact that it's completely, uh, it's a completely dry dissection. Now, this is the same step of the operation for duodenal adenocarcinoma. And you will immediately see that it's very inflamed. It's edematous. Uh, the tissue kind of um, does not want to be mobilized as easily uh, as the previous part of the, of the video. Um, you can so-called feel the weight of the duodenum on the, inst on the instruments. You can see that we have to use um, a different uh, energy source to do the dissection to keep it dry. And it's still uh, a lot bloodier than the first part that you saw. We're going to see in a minute the, um, some of the lymphadenectomy. Here, this is the lymphadenectomy around the, uh, the hepatic artery. This is the ligation of the GDA. And now um, dividing the pancreas. Uh, which we will see soon that is a very, um, very soft pancreas. And this is the dissection around the SMV portal vein. Uh, again, you can see that we have to apply a lot of pressure on the tissue on the left now, which is the head of the pancreas and the second part of the duodenum, just to do the exposure. And uh, you can see that the tissue is very vascular. Um, everything is filled with fluid from the inflammation. A lot of clipping. There is also, uh, you will see in a second, the use of a vascular stapler that is very unusual for us to use in this uh, part of the procedure.
And again, just a lot of force to do the traction uh, that is usually uh, less of a problem when you deal with the very small pancreatic uh, adenocal sinoma. Now, this again is a reconstruction of a, of a case of pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and you can see that you can relatively easily recognize the uh, pancreatic duct. Um, the anastomosis um, is, is done without any special uh, instrumentation. Um, the tissue of the pancreas is very fibrotic, like we are used to seeing in pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, and it's less bloody, it's easier to pass the needle through it, the tissue holds better. And now again, will be a, a video that shows the challenges of uh, the duodenal case. So the first thing you can see is that we have to use an angiocast just to recognize the, uh, even with the resolution of the robot, just to recognize the, the, the position of the pancreatic duct. And also that the pancreatic tissue itself, the pancreas is relatively healthy in these cases. And you can really see the lobules and you can see that it's a lot bloodier um, for the, the MPD, um, the, uh, for its um, uh, size to fit the size of the um, enterotomy, we used um, the tip of the bovi. Uh, so not to make uh, a hole that's too big. So this procedure is uh, a lot more challenging, not only in the dissection part, but also in the reconstruction. And this is uh, just the, um, um, the hepatico jejunostomy, just uh, you know, to see something nice. Posterior layer and uh, the anterior layer. Okay, I'm gonna move forward. Um, so, uh, any any comments uh, about what we just saw? So, this is Dave Kuby. How are you guys? Um, thank you for putting this session on. I guess my first question is: So, is this the same patient? Did you go straight to the operating room? Is that what you're showing us? This patient uh, went straight to the operating room at the point uh, that we left the discussion. Uh, there was a lot of thought whether or not to repeat and uh, try to do more endoscopies. Um, the decision was that because he's young and he can tolerate um, the procedure because there was no evidence of distant disease and mainly because he was obstructed and it was obvious um, that uh, specifically, if it's a if it's a malignant disease, we do not want to continue to manipulate uh, that tissue, and that therefore the patient went uh, went for surgery. I have a question. Um, I don't do any cancer surgery. Uh, just say you know a lot of people don't do cancer surgery. So in this case, this patient has two problems, right? He might have a potential cancer, but you guys actually never named it, right? There was no diagnosis. Uh, he has a mechanical problem, right? Would it be kind of incorrect for a, a general surgeon um, to do a bypass and maybe get a tissue sample and then send it off to a tertiary center for cancer operation? Because I mean, he has two different problems, right? One is the cancer and one is the obstruction, right? If you relieve the obstruction, is that booby trapping it for the cancer surgeon? Or is that something, uh, you know, somewhere if they're in like Alaska or whatever, uh, someone can kind of do this to resolve one problem. But remember the other problem, the tumor has never not been identified or named. So, right, you, you name, you stage, then you treat, right? But it hasn't been named, right? So would it be so wrong? or a general surgeon or any other surgeon to relieve the obstruction problem and leave the cancer question for someone else. So I, the, so the, but, I was, I was going to make a comment based on this because I heard, you know, what Dr. Bulmer said, and I wanted just to play devil's advocate a little bit. 
I agree. When you have a mechanical obstruction, you're going to be more inclined to do an operation up front, especially because it is a plumbing problem. But there is a biology issue as well. And for certain diseases like pancreatic ductal, if we can give chemotherapy up front, we're starting to feel like that is becoming a proper standard. Duodenal cancer, I don't think we have enough data to show that a preoperative strategy really is critical. But one of the things that I noticed on the preoperative imaging was that um, extent of thickening of the duodenum was quite extensive. It wasn't just in the third portion. It looked like the entire duodenum was thickened. So one of the things you want to be somewhat cognizant of, are you going to give a reasonable ca cancer operation from the get-go? And do you have options to help this patient with nutrition before um, doing an operation so you can better stage the patient and have a better sense of what you're going to be doing before possibly doing a less adequate cancer operation. Alex Rosemurky here. Uh, Dr. Volmer was, was my comments earlier that he uh, uh, expanded upon when I said that I think this patient needs uh, expeditious evaluation and a trip to the OR. Uh, the um, for a surgeon to operate on this patient as if this is a benign lesion and if it turns out to be cancer, they'll get a reoperation is absolutely unconscionable to me. And uh, if I was given somebody their boards, uh, I'd flunk them for it. It's unconscionable that we, that we would have that mindset. Uh, this patient needs one operation, one really good operation, and it needs to be well done. Now, should the patient have undergone another EUS or undergone another whatever, I note that the guidelines for those things are all written by the people who do that stuff. That's like asking little kids if they like candy. It, uh, you know the answer before you get the answer from them. And uh, the, uh, with regard to what is this, out of curiosity, uh, some years ago, I looked up uh, things that masquerade as malignancy in the bile duct, duodenum, and pancreas. And out of over a thousand resections that we did, uh, what I took away from it was is this, uh, there are some people that need to learn how to read CT scans. And there's another group of surgeons that need to learn how to talk to people and find out about uh, what they're feeling and what the deal is. But in some total, there were probably, and I'm gonna hesitate a little bit on the exactness of this number, but probably 15 people out of a thousand that got not the, not that they didn't get the operation they needed. They got an operation that worked, but they could have gotten by with the bypass. Uh, and so they didn't get the operation that they, could have gotten, which carries clearly less morbidity, but they uh, they got the operation that they needed in the vast, vast, vast majority of circumstances. And so, uh, and I don't, think, and I and I would I would cross the street to wrestle with somebody uh, over whether or not uh, patients with adenocarcinoma the pancreas should be in the therapy. Well, I'd love to see that randomized controlled trial. And, uh, and there, there's no data, the, the weather changes and the data uh, and our approach to things change, but it's not data driven. Neither of them are data driven. Dr. Rosemary, all, all due respect, I, I actually beg to differ with you on this particular issue. I will, I'll present two vignettes since we're just doing surgical vignettes as opposed to randomized controlled studies. I did an operation on someone almost exactly like this without tissue diagnosis. How early in my career, maybe the second year of my career. And I will say that this person had a perforated, a perforated, not tumor, ulcer. And I did a Whipple operation at the first get-go for the patient. I actually had my one and only ureteral injury of my entire career in this setting. And the patient, who still loves me to this day, had multiple operations ending in a nephrectomy. And you can say that this is because of um, poor patients, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I recently had an operation in which the patient had a proven duodenal cancer, but was tremendously deconditioned, had lost a ton of weight. Um, and I ended up doing a laparoscopic bypass on her. She was not, she didn't have biliary obstruction, but I did a laparoscopic um, gastric bypass on her for complete obstruction. She ended up having neoadjuvant therapy. The tumor actually reduced in size and we've successfully done a Whipple operation. So I just I just wanted to put out, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm putting out there for the trainees that I, I think that as surgical oncologists, 
we are our people that take care of patients that may have malignancy and may have multi different kinds of disease. We have to not just think about the tool we have, which we're all surgeons are, are you know, we're, 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 we're hammers and the whole world looks like a nail. But our strength is that we can actually deploy different technology, even if we don't usually deploy it ourselves. That's my opinion, one person's opinion. I, I, you're right. I, I disagree with what you say, basically. And uh, I, I think that the problems the first patient ran into were truly unfortunate and probably wouldn't happen today. Uh, with regard to a big duodenal perforation like that, putting a gram patch on it or doing something, whatever, uh, is, is no simple matter. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I stand by what I said. Um, I don't think everyone should be doing Whipples, though. They are not doing Whipples on a regular basis. I'm not promoting that everybody do them any more than I am promoting that anybody on this phone call should be doing open heart surgery. But, but uh, there are places where the operation is very well done and patients should seek it. One of the unfortunate parts about centralization of care is that if you have somebody from, say, Wyoming, uh, or some place that's very underpopulated, uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where I grew up, uh, they shouldn't have these operations there. They should go to a, a nearby city. Well, then you'd say, well, then yes, okay, that's fine. But then what's gonna end up happening is patients that need to be operated upon locally aren't going to receive the care that they need. There is a cost to centralization of care. It's a discussion, but I don't think that it, it, it has much merit. I see, um, you need to turn. I see a lot of um, delay in care because uh, in not tertiary, but uh, community uh, uh, hospitals, et cetera, that are trying to get to a diagnosis. And instead of sending the patient to a, to a tertiary hospital where they can get a definitive operation, they keep on like repeating 10 times EUSs, ERCPs, and then sometimes take him to surgery, take him to take the gallbladder out, and that's not the problem. That delay of, of care is really should not be done in those uh, those uh, uh, community uh, uh, areas and be sent to um, a tertiary hospital where they can do the you know take the patient to, to, through an operation, get the appropriate biopsies intraoperatively. If it's cancer, proceed with an operation. If it's not, can do the bypass. But sitting in a and in, in taking those patients multiple times for an, through an operation or keep on wasting the time trying to get a biopsy. I mean, to remember how we used those operations before we had endoscopic ultrasound. If you have a patient at a certain age group with a painless jaundice, or in this case, that's duodenal cancer, but in general, endoscopic ultrasound, everybody wants it today, and we still very much pursue it. But sometimes I had a patient that the, the gastroenterologist in another facility couldn't get to the duodenum, but kept on trying. Meanwhile, two months later, the patient finally got to a tertiary hospital because they absolutely could not. The delay is really concerning. And in this patient to try to get still a biopsy is why not just take them to the heart, to the operating room. If they try to do it, they, they, they obstructed, get the biopsy intraoperatively and then do whatever is necessary appropriately. What and so for, for, I mean, this is a, a conversation. I know there'll be a million different uh, opinions, but uh, we, for the sake of time, we should continue on with the presentation. Why don't we move ahead? Let's have more discussion at the end. I, I would like to have more trainees talk and less of us old people talking. So let's why don't we move the have sure. the Sharona, what percentage Who's of old people? Me. Sharona, what percentage of your patient patients in clinical associated US uh, ERCPs or stent placement and the like? Is that an uncommon event? What's the question that's been here? Story of my life. Repeat the question. I I, I did the, the connection that, wasn't right. Patients that you can we just move ahead with the case and have discussion at the end? Because I really I I have I have another Zoom at six. I really want to get through this case and I I want to fulfill my commitment to the SSAT. Uh, there you go. Moran, you want to go ahead? Yep. 
Okay, so a couple of the topics that uh, came up in this very interesting uh, conversation. So the first thing I'm gonna uh, address is the role of neoadjuvant therapy for this specific entity of duodenal adenocarcinoma. So like uh, some of you mentioned, uh, the wind is uh, really uh, in the direction of uh, neoadjuvant therapy, even for resectable uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. However, for uh, duodenal adenocarcinoma, uh, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not the same. Uh, this was published in Surgical Oncology Annals of Surgical Oncology just now in January of uh, 23. Uh, it's based on the National uh, Cancer Database. Uh, this is a combined. Um, uh, paper from uh, um, centers in California and Pittsburgh. Um, they assessed uh, 7,000 cases of non-pancreatic periampular adenocarcinoma, and uh, and they saw the effect of um, of uh, neoadjuvant therapy. What they saw is that uh, all tumor types were downstaged with the treatment. However. Uh, only cholangiocarcinoma had a benefit in survival after neoadjuvant therapy. And if you look at the literature, there is really a lot of um, um, like small series and uh, case reports about duodenal adenocarcinomas that were, were um, for example, um, a downstage from unresectable to resectable disease. But the NCCN guidelines and also this paper uh, still do not recommend the usual uh, tr neoadjuvant treatment for duodenal adenocarcinoma, and it is only to be done only in non-resectable cases. This is as of now. Um, the next topic, oh, just a second, uh, which I'm just going to um, relate to very shortly, is the um, uh, role of the lymphadenectomy. So we know that uh, in recent years, the, every time that the NCC guidelines get updated, uh, the, the minimal uh, number of lymph nodes uh, goes up almost uh, for each type of uh, foregut cancer, whether it's gastric, esophageal, um, also pancreatic cancer. And um, in this specific subject, subject the, the guidelines are still uh, recommending uh, five to eight um, lymph nodes uh, for duodenal adenocarcinoma. Uh, however, I, I guess this number will sound low to everyone who does cancer surgery. And, and this is a paper from Germany from 2018 uh, that showed uh, what we know from other types of malignancies that improved lymphadenectomy, improved survival, and they set the number at 16. So that's just another uh, point to think about. Um, even if we... Um, uh, go for surgery we, when we don't have tissue diagnosis, uh, we should also always keep in mind, in my opinion, uh, to give the patient a good, good oncologic uh, surgery. And a major part of that is the lymphadenectomy. Um, now, um, to go back to the thing that brought us to discuss this topic to begin with, our kind of feeling that these patients are having um, difficult procedures and they're healing is uh, is less uh, um, like is slower than what we expect with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So um, this paper uh, is based on the um, national database from the Netherlands, which is a very uh, very good, uh, very reliable um, uh, database, and it's a national audit um, that compared um, the two hundred and sixty four. Uh, Whipples that they did for duodenal adenocarcinoma with other indications, uh, malignant indications. And they did see that um, this specific disease um, in the short term, in the short term uh, uh, gives more complications, more ICU admissions, uh, more post-operative pancreatic fistulas. They had more intervention than they even had higher uh, in, in hospital mortality. Uh, which just goes to show a lot of time in surgery when you feel something uh, in your instincts, then you look at the literature and you find out that someone already uh, thought about it. And the last uh, thing uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out is that maybe like a light at the end of the tunnel is that um, 
uh, for the long-term outcome of these patients with uh, uh, duodenal adenocalcinoma, then definitely what we uh, all know from med school uh, is, uh, is uh, true that uh, even though it's a rare disease, um, it is, um, it is a disease with better biology than other periampillary tumors. And here you can see that although it was only 7% of, uh, of um, diagnosis made between 2012 and 2018 um, um, in, uh, in the Netherlands and in Germany, 35% um, of uh, the pancreatic adenocalcinoma went for resection um, compared with 60% of the duodenal adenocalcinomas. And the three-year survival uh, was a lot better for the duodenal cases uh, compared with the pancreatic cases. Um, and those that were resected obviously had the best outcome uh, compared to those that did not uh, get surgery. So uh, back to WN, uh, he underwent a robotic quipple, like I mentioned. It only took about 10 hours, a uh, very challenging procedure, um, uh, very uh, uh, nerve-wracking, long. Um, Postoperatively, uh, he developed a delayed gastric emptying. He also had a grade A uh, postoperative pancreatic fistula. Everything was managed conservatively. He did not require any reinterventions. Uh, his pathology was pretty um, um, less encouraging. Uh, moderately to poorly differentiated adenocalcinoma, like someone here pointed out, the tumor was pretty big. Uh, it uh, spanned over the uh, first, second, and third part of the duodenum. Uh, the margins were negative, but it did have a very uh, high uh, lymph node ratio with 16 positive lymph nodes out of uh, 22. He is currently under adjuvant therapy. And that's it. How long did it take for him to get adjuvant therapy, just out of curiosity? Um, I have to check exactly, but uh, it was around uh, five or six weeks. It was not very delayed. Uh, he um, was discharged from the hospital on day, on day 10, which is long compared to uh, our cases that usually go home on day four. And this was because of the delayed gastric emptying. He did go home with a drain. Uh, which was removed uh, in his uh, follow-up appointment in the office. Uh, but he started uh, the adjuvant therapy uh, as planned. Great. Any discussions from the group? Dr. Kubi, see you have your hand up. Yeah, just to kind of close the discussion on the cancer aspect. You know, um, congratulations on... Um, you know, getting this patient through this operation safely. Uh, I, you know, 10 days for an operation like this uh, makes sense. And it sounds like he got started on adjuvant in a reasonable time. You know, the big picture is, um, yes, I think mechanically you've probably helped the guy so he can eat and, and do that. I don't know cancer wise that this patient's going to do well. It sounds like it's horrible disease. And I look at the original scan and I still say that this looked like a very infiltrative process that extended very high to very low. So I sit back and I say, yeah, you showed the NCDB and the, and the data from um, overseas, from, the, from uh, uh, the Netherlands. I, but I get back and say, this is not your typical duodenal adenocarcinoma patient. This is a very extensive, probably a systemic disease, 16 out of 18 lymph nodes. So if he did have a complication from his surgery, he never would have gotten to adjuvant therapy. And really, the best therapy for this particular patient was systemic therapy. Um, certainly needs to be worked up to see if he has Lynch or anything to be um, a candidate for immunotherapy. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, with the extent of this disease, uh, you, you know, okay, now he can eat, but he still has a really, really bad cancer. I would be very interested in questions from the trainees or thoughts. I realized that I've been uh, made to realize that it's a power dynamic for all of us. Um, so if, if anybody wants to um, direct message me, you're welcome to, or send me an email. I have, I'm on my email, jennifer.tseng at bsc.org. Or, but but I, I think these are important questions. Like we've learned these things and we all love surgery. 
we all love to do surgery. Is, is surgery is, is great and surgery is curative for all of these tumors. Even if you can get a patient through without a complication, and I, I, I bared my soul about a, a patient that still haunts me early in my career, is a, it, you know, what's, the, what's the next step? I actually do. This is Cecily Dupree. I'm the um, CGI fellow at Methodist Richardson. I do have a question along those lines. You know, if if um, if it is true that from the from the get go that this cancer was, I mean, undiagnosed cancer, but obviously very involved. Um, instead of proceeding with a Whipple, which would have had potentially variable results, would it have been a viable option to do? a gastrojejunostomy and to do a biopsy intraoperatively to kind of have a more definitive diagnosis at that time? I would challenge you that that opportunity to get the biopsy is not going to be that easy as you think it is. So the one thing would be is if you were able to put a scope in and look and there was a metastatic disease that you could clearly see, but that's very, it's actually a rarity in ampullary and duodenal cancers that you're going to find that and get that easy liver biopsy. But the ability to biopsy the duodenum itself, and particularly that particular infiltrative type of situation, um, good luck with that. Okay. You're going to do a laparoscopic approach to that. Go and try and, and put a needle into that and, and get away with it or find an, a, a tumor area that you can shave off or something like that. It's not as easy as, as you think. So I think, I think that you could presume that and do the, your GJ and go down this line uh, of thinking uh, and apply, but you'd have to be able to apply your, uh, at your therapy uh, without the biopsy because you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it internally as was already attempted and it's not easy to get it externally. So I, was I, I agree with Dr. Bulmer completely, except my tongue is sharper, and uh, and I apologize for that. But uh, I, I think that um, that given this patient a gastrojejunostomy and and deferring on cancer with largely inefficacious uh, uh, chemotherapy is is not the road to go down. It's my opinion. The reason why I brought, I asked Dr. Ross and, and Moran the, the performance out of the patient is because I, I think it matters. We, those of us, and I said, I defined old as anyone who's my age or older, but we, we were taught by Dr. Cameron et al. That, that anyone who might need a Whipple operation should get a Whipple operation. Keith Lillamo, when he was a youngish attending and I was an oldish resident, told me the only reason why people in Baltimore didn't have have a pancreas is, or didn't have a Whipple is because they already had a Whipple already at, at Hopkins. So, um, but that being said, I think the performance status is important and a tissue diagnosis is important. You have to be able to establish that the patient actually has cancer before you treat them with new and therapy. And then you have to establish that they can actually tolerate an operation in a timely fashion to actually get the systemic therapy that they need. And, and as hard as that is, sometimes the right operation is to do nothing. And that is very hard for us as surgeons. We love to operate. It's our favorite thing to do. Sometimes to realize the first step is not an operation, but I always tell my patients, listen, I'm your surgeon. No, and, and I'm planning on operating you in three months or whatever it is after your first six cycles of chemotherapy or I'm planning on operating. We have a date. I'm your surgeon. And that helps them and it helps me. I would like to uh, uh, point out that um, I think uh, as a, um, surgeon in training, um, definitely um, this this case would be a lot easy, easier, so-called, uh, if this patient had vascular involvement on the scan or if he had uh, metastasis. Um, the, the reason I chose uh, this specific case is because it was clear that it's a bad disease. There was a very um, uh, challenging. It was very challenging to go in again and biopsy again. There was a very uh, long discussion of whether or not this will change the management. And what what makes it uh, like an interesting case for discussion is the fact that there was no um, um, like excuse so called to to go and really do uh, this um, 
um, uh, maybe only a bypass procedure uh, and then send the patient for uh, for uh, therapy, e even though it's not the, the recommendation. But again, if he was in an advanced uh, stage that there would be any other choice. And um, I think um, in, in this uh, situation, what uh, affects it, it's really where you're at. And um, training and in, in um, in my former training in the in a hospital that we did a lot of uh, we were very surgical oncology oriented however we did not see the volume of whipples that i see here now i have to say that this definitely affects the decision and um, um, definitely if if the patient is lucky enough to get to a tertiary center uh, that has a lot of experience with it then, then not like Dr. Tseng said, first of all, you have to look at the patient and see uh, who is he and uh, what's his uh, status, but also where he ended up being. And um, I would also like to argue that uh, taking a malnourished patient uh, and, um, and just bypass and say, um, I mean, it has for sure less uh, morbid uh, profile than a Whipple, but it still has its own complication. And I also um, can dig up from my past a, ca a case similar that never got to, uh, to a final diagnosis and uh, treatment because of complications from a bypass procedure. So I think it really depends on where you, on where you end up. Jennifer, if there's no other trainee discussion, I would like to say something about the technical aspects about this, but Please, someone else is is queued hey, up. I appreciate you having your hand up, which is so rare for us surgeons, Chuck. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, back to the uh, operation aspect. So I was really taken back by your description about this being harder. Uh, I would uh, not, I would challenge that in, on the whole. When you do a Whipple procedure, it's a tale of two operations every time. It's the front half getting it out, and it's the second half um, uh, putting it back together. The front half is almost always dominated by thoughts about oncologic efficacy, okay? The back half is always about complication management and prevention of, of uh, complications thereafter, okay? So what's the next week gonna be like for you after the operation? Um, generally, when you do a Whipple procedure, you're gonna have one of those two halves be good for you, the other is not gonna be good for you, okay? In this particular case, it's generally going to be the case that a duodenal ampullary or a cholangio is going to be the easier part of the operation is your resection because there's not generally vascular involvement. These are limited kind of things. There's um, normal tissue. Uh, otherwise, it's just not as much of a slog to get that done and remove it. The harder part comes on the backside of the reconstruction aspects. And this and your pictures kind of demonstrated what that's all about. So a case like this, um, I actually think you were complaining about the difficulty of how to do this probably from the robotic standpoint. In an open operation, we wouldn't have these concerns that you were talking about in terms of the nature of this, uh, the tissue and that kind of stuff. But the element of the re reconstruction aspect is where this gets really tricky. So this is going to be, there's going to be two uh, pitfalls here. One is going to be actually the hepatocojejunostomy is more likely to leak on this kind of case because it's never been dilated. Sometimes these are really wholly normal bile ducts that are uh, under a centimeter in size and have tissue paper for tissue. So you're more likely going to get in trouble with, with that kind of thing in this kind of case than other cases. And then back to the pancreatic fistula aspect. This is an FRS seven baseline, six at least, if not seven. That um, uh, puts it in the high risk zone. And this is the kind of thing where you're gonna have to be adaptable with how you do your anastomosis or not. Uh, doing the same thing every time because it's the only way you can do it can get you uh, in some trouble here when there's a lot of alternatives to how to reconstruct that in a more tricky situation with that tissue. I would say the last thing I would advocate for this is this is the case that you want to put a stent in, an externalized stent, to um, uh, because of the chance of the leak. And heretofore, uh, I have yet to see a with regularity anyone who has done that robotically uh, for these kind of cases. Uh, and I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that the data will say that the 
better thing to prevent leaks on this, to get yourself down to that 15% rate is going to be an externalized stent process. And uh, I think that is the better thing to do for the patient. So anyway, um, that's, that's the thoughts on this. It's actually the backside of the operation on here that's the more threatening thing. Thank you. Great, Thank that you. is really wonderful. I, I actually just vainly ask the people if they can, if they're not on, 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 on the um, can, to sh show their faces if they want to. To actually, I'll ask the SAT staff if they're on to take a few screenshots when people look presentable. So, because I think this is just a, such a great, robust discussion. And I think we completely disagreed without being disagreeable, which is what Joe Bicey always told me is important. And that's what we try to do with the SSAT. So if people can sh uh, share their faces that they can, and I, I don't know who is staffing us, Bev, maybe, um, but if they can take pictures, I'm really bad at taking pictures, despite, I, I won't say anything about being an agent. I just, I, I've gotten in trouble recently for being unfiltered, but you, um, but this is just so great. I learned a ton. And if we can have senior people and junior people agree or disagree without being disagreeable, this is how we all learn. So I would actually really ask a trainee to say something. And then <laughs> I would I would love for Dr. Martin or Dr. Um, Slav Slavin or, or anybody who's a trainee here um, say something. And, and also my last thing before I let, let people talk is please come to the SSAT. Please, if you don't know me, I would love to hear from you. And if you don't, and 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 I would love to introduce you to other people. And so this is our, we're reimagining the SAT to be more, I think, uh, younger, more, more, look more like the face of us and the patients that we serve and to be uh, an experience, which is both educational, but more of a two-way or not even bi-directional, but multi-directional education. So I've learned a ton from the trainees as well as from the senior people. And I love to see babies and pets on any chat that I ever see. So I really appreciate that. Um, and my kids are 17 and 15 and they don't want me in the same room with them. So I, I really think is uh, basically my rules are, as long as you're not in the bathroom or, or driving, which in which it would be dangerous to be arrested by the governor of Massachusetts, I, I, I love to see people and we are part of our life. Work is life. Like I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in work-home balance because work is a very important part of our lives. So I'll get off my soapbox. We have three minutes. I would, I would love one of the trainees to sum up what this is, anything, but what this has done for them. Hi, I'm Cesar. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm the fellow at University of Missouri. I just want to congratulate Dr. Slavin. This, is, this has been an excellent case, very good dis discussion, and uh, we have learned a lot today, certainly. Different ways of viewing things, seeing things, and kind of see how to approach them. Thank you, Dr. Slavin. Thank you very much, Dr. Slavin. And I think, Dr. Singh, you got your newest member of SSAT right here. So you asked for it and a uh, baby appeared. So there we go. Um, thank you all so much tonight for this great discussion. And we look forward to having you on a monthly basis. Um, our next discussion is going to be about complex abdominal wall hernias on February 13th. So just short of Valentine's Day. It's given by the fellows from Valley Health. Um, so please check your emails for those invitations to follow. Um, and if you all could retweet everything, screenshots tonight, I think getting the word out about this is um, really um, an excellent Monday night discussion and lots of feedback um, for our fellow for her presentation because you did an excellent job. And Dr. Dr. Nance, can I just say one thing really quickly? Sure, Dr. Nairaj. Um, so just to say to everyone, you know, this mode of training is really something special and what the SSAT is trying to promote. I'm going to make an un, uh, unabashed uh, plea for all of you to think about this training paradigm at your institutions and Dr. Sang and group to please, um, you know, continue to support this effort uh, for the fellows. It's great for them to see these senior people on these calls and get your opinions. Uh, I'm so grateful to you for taking this and for doing this and Dr. Benzi for le leading this effort. Um, but we're really SSAT strong. This is an amazing society, as Dr. Sang said. And me in private practice, they've accepted me. So everyone is uh, sort of accepted in this place. So please remember that it's a truly great place and come to the, the meeting. 
Thank you, Dr. Benzi. Great job, thank everyone. And, and, and we are right at six. And thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.